This is Rocky Snyder. At the tone, leave your name and message, and I'll get back to you. Hey, Rock, it's Coach CP. You better not be slowing down in your old age, mate. Give me a call so I can kick you off. Look forward to catching up soon. Cheers for now. <laughs> On today's episode, Running Easy, we're going to have a chat with Coach G.P. Pearlberg, not only a running coach and marathon runner himself, but the author of Run Tall, Run Easy. You, you've been running, oh my God, all your life, being the marathon runner and so on, but you moved to Jersey back in the early 2000s. Yes. That, was, that must have been kind of a uh, climate shock to some degree after running in Santa Cruz. It, it was, it, it was, because um, growing up in England, um, really wasn't a humid situation, um, nothing to the level of, of, of here in the East Coast, not even, and of course, you, you know, you're from the East Coast, you know, you experienced it before I did, uh, growing up in the East Coast, um, still living in, started my running career in, in California, Los Angeles, and then of course in Santa Cruz, so long story short, when we came back to, first move back, as you said, uh, early 2000s, we came back in October of 01, as a matter of fact, and that winter, Oh, uh, one into early oh two was pretty mild so i'm like oh this isn't too bad this is fine um kind of sailed on through the spring and then oh i can still remember the first humid run uh in the summer of oh two i i i did not know what hit me and i was you know obviously back in those days in pretty decent shape and i it was something i'd never experienced it was extraordinary and it's always tough i mean there's uh, I, I never buy into people say, oh, you get used to it. No, you don't. It's, you know, if it's 90 degrees and, and, and 95% humidity, you don't get by, you don't, you don't get used to it. What frustrates me, and this is actually a really interesting topic, and it, it actually ties in in a similar but different ways to technology, is what frustrates me now, having run for about the same length of time as you've been surfing, is, is that I, I can't, as a coach now, um, and I, I, just to preface this, you know, I, you know my history as a runner, the people I ran with. I was very fortunate with Greg Brock and, and the, the merry band of runners that I was around. were all about a decade older than me. That They were very smart, very intelligent process to training. Incredibly dedicated and loyal to the fundamentals of physiology. Really trained me the right way. Just in the same way you would really intelligently strength train somebody. Um, and so what really frustrates me is the, is the lack of, not obviously this is stereotypical, but generally the lack of rational thought process to training in general and to running, um, be it humidity, be, and I find the novice runners and the elite runners the easiest to deal with. Novice runners will generally listen to you, sort of like just wide-eyed and just listen to what, you know, the good advice you're giving them. Elite athletes, for the most part, not all, but for the most part, generally get it. That, that, that you know that old expression, a little, a little knowledge is dangerous, can be dangerous? That, that sort of like 18 to 20-minute 5K male runner, 20 to 24-minute female runner. Again, there's some crossover there. It just there's a compulsiveness there and a lack of rationale. For example, you could be at a local 5K in August. And it's freaking 90 degrees out, 79% humidity, and people are frustrated about the running times, you know, afterwards. And I just, my runners won't do it. At least they won't do it in front of me. Because it's just, I cannot abide by uh, the compulsiveness. I have an expression that I use. I didn't invent it. I got it from somewhere. Couldn't even tell you where. It's called extreme, not compulsive. You know, the type of training we do is extreme. It's intense. In the, an, a phrase that I came... Actually, interesting enough, I was being interviewed a few years ago by Jonathan Beverly, who at the time was the editor-in-chief of Running Times. It was after my second book, the second edition of my book came out. We were chatting on the phone, and, and I just threw in that expression, image an Olympian, as just a matter of course of conversation. Then he stopped me. And he said, well, what was that? And I said, what was, what was the image of something? I said, oh, image of an Olympian. He said, well, what is that exactly? I said, well... It means that we're not all going to be Olympians, but we can, we can, we can um, apply ourselves to the fundamentals of training that they use. For example, if we were going to, if you and I, well, you could do it. I certainly couldn't. But if, if we had an aspiration to climb Everest, then I'm intelligent enough to know I'm not going to be as fast as a guy who's 
an, an experienced professional uh, mountaineer, but I would at least have the sensibility to apply their intelligent trainings because their trainings have been given to them, provided to them either by themselves or by experienced mountaineer coaches. So why not use that training? And so it drives me nuts. Um, uh, and, and, and this is really cool. I think you'll like this little segue to the second part of the story. When I was training in Santa Cruz, most of, as you may remember, most of my training partners were Hispanic, were Mexican. Javier Arano, yeah. uh, Jose Espuro, and Oscar, and so on, and so Albert Villatore, and so on. And they would have this expression called El Dragon, the dragon, right? So when I first joined them, I could hear them talking about the dragon, the dragon. We used to go and run this hellacious hill fairway, which is off of Soquel Drive. Yeah. And a hellacious, hellacious workout. And we would do our one so-called track and we'd jog over there in complete silence because it was as if you were going to the guillotine. This workout was so And um, so when I got comfortable enough to, to, to ask them about the dragon, I understood my Spanish was not great, it still isn't, but I could understand it meant the dragon, but I didn't know what the context was. But the context is something I've used from then to this day with my boys. And that is, and certainly with my athletes, that is the dragon is this sort of mythical entity. Greg Brock, who was, you know, classic American, who's cut through it and just say, you either respect physiology or, or, or voluntarily or, 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 or phys Mother Nature will do it for you, which is sort of a simplistic way of putting it, but very accurate. But El Dragon, I love the mystique of El Dragon, was this mythical entity out there that he would be the gatekeeper, he or she would be the gatekeeper of applied intelligent training. And if you, abused it by training with a cold or you're coming down with a flu or whatever you're training with an achilles injury the dragon's going to get you it's not a question if it's going to get you and I, i've told that for sam for years you know you want to be the level of soccer player you want to be but you don't feel like hey, i don't do this anymore but you know you don't you just want to blow off a session you don't want to get out and practice then that's okay but the dragon's watching he's going to get you he's it's not a if and I use that with athletes all the time. And so these people that are sort of 5Ks in, all, in August and July, just and they, they're just completely abusing. They're, they're just compulsive and they're not understanding the intelligent laws of the dragon. So I use the dragon as a very, very powerful coaching tool right now. If I have to chastise, you mentioned before with Jack about how you went about sort of giving him a ration, but in an intelligent way to make it really count. That's all I have to do. You, I'm just a messenger, Mr. Athlete of mine. I'm just a messenger. That's all I am. I'm a fiduciary. The dragon will get you. And right now, we've got people that have an extreme rate of change in their lifestyle that, yes, you're going out and running, and that's phenomenal. But unless you're really focusing on how your body is feeling with the runs, the, your, your reaction to when you're running as well as how you feel afterwards, how are you sleeping, and so on, I think we're going to see just a uh, – you not to use pandemic any more than it's already been used, but running injuries are going to be through the roof because no people question. are not getting so accustomed to it. No question. So, so that comes right back to what I was saying before about El Dragon. Everything leads back to El Dragon because El Dragon is just a representation of balance and common sense. And you, what you said before about you either injured or running between injuries is a hundred percent accurate. And by the way, that technology is great. Listen, we're, we're using technology now. So this is obviously a time and a place. To, no question about it. Garmin watches have some great applications to them. But I do believe strongly in what I said. And so much of what I do is literally trying to go back in time to, to teach my runners more patience, to go back intrinsically. And then, yes, you can use technology. But, but you've got to learn the basics first. That's my point. So within your running coaching, you wrote Run Tall, Run Easy. And you came up with you. a few years well, back. Remember inspiring me because you'd, you'd already started in your books. You were the one. I remember being in the car with you. You probably forgot this. You were the one that actually inspired me, uh, guided me uh, to, to start that book. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, I wrote the book. And now the ebook. And the ebook as well. So obviously it kind of the, just the, the title says it all, Run Tall, Run Easy. I mean, if there are other little nuggets that you could share out of the book what what would they be what, what what are the top things that you tell your runners of all stages all ages so so i 
the short answer to that is that most coaches understandably focus on the on, on the what I call the motor of the of the automobile. You know, the, the tweak in the engine, the fitness, the cardiopulmonary. You know, working on the speed, which is understandable. The fitness, of course, you have to have that. But too many coaches, either through lack of knowledge or lack of interest, don't focus on the efficiency of the movement. And it goes to your point before. You, you know, you're either injured or, or between it. And so. Um, over the past 25 plus years, I work now with so many, uh, probably like you do, I'm sure, with so many uh, podiatrists and uh, orthopedic surgeons that have sent me, they, they, you know, they fixed the issue that the runners had, and then they send them to me to try to make sure the issue doesn't sustain. And so I would implore people to spend time, either research it, or they can, re they can reach out to me, or somebody local to them if they can, F spend time working on your game. Spend time working on your efficiency. Um, split the body in two. I use this very simplistic analogy of a bow and arrow. Obviously, they have to work it in unison together, but there's no point in working on the arrow and having this fancy arrow if the bow is not working properly. And the bow and the arrow means the arrow is the lower body from the hips down, ultimately how you strike the ground, the bow being essentially the upper body, particularly the shoulder area and the arm movement. Focus on how you use your upper body to make your lower body more efficient. So spend time working on your game and, and, and focus on being as, think about Michael Phelps moving through the water or a shark, we mentioned sharks earlier on, moving through the water as efficiently as possible with as little waves and wash. And that's the same way with running. You want to be as efficient as you possibly can. Well, not everybody's the same. We're not trying to copy an elite runner, but we're trying to aspire to some of the, um, for some of the uh, movements they have and trying to aspire towards those those elements without copying them because we're obviously different we have different length limbs and, and our, our ligaments and tendons are different and so on um but and our skeletal system is in different lengths but essentially there's certain fundamentals it all comes down to how you strike the ground you know if you jumped out of a four-story window which i don't recommend it's not an issue until you hit the ground and and, and so same when you run the issue comes when you strike the ground but that process is started earlier on at takeoff and in flight so the bow and the arrow is so ultimately focus on how you strike the ground but it really focus on quietening the body down and and if you spend just a few minutes a day working on your flexibility your strength training which is of course in your sphere um to help you withstand the impact of running running is not bad for you rocky as people think it is bad running is bad for you Exactly. There's no such thing as a bad exercise. It all depends on the body that's performing it, whether it's yeah. going to be injurious or beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's amazing running, just things like the wrist. You know, if you ask people, if you did a canvas of people on a street corner about important air, and I use the word areas of the body as opposed to muscles, you know, they'd give you good answers. They'd give you, yeah, well, legs are important, the heart's important, the, the gluteus muscles are important. Yeah, well, true. But things like the wrist, are so important because a, f a fixed wrist, I mean, I can, I can solve somebody's cross rotation and guys and girls have different issues. Um, girls often, not exclusively, can over rotate, over cross rotate. That comes, they don't flex the wrist. It's hard to explain in, 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 in this situation, but, but small elements, and this is my book, how you flex the wrist will simply er eradicate over rotation of the upper body. If you minimize over rotation of the upper body, um, you're going to save yourself a lot of energy. Um, for sure. So minimizing vertical movement and so on. They, these are all things that, are, that apply to it. So basically bad running, I'm giving you, not really giving the specifics here because it's so difficult. Well, it's good. I like that because it, it, through my uh, process of learning uh, the educational workshops and classes and mentors that I've had over the years, you know, it really, for me, uh, it, human movement in essence boils down to two actions, landing on planet earth, and leaving planet Earth, right? 100%. That's, that's what we do. We can, either, we can either hit the ground or we can push off of it. When we hit the planet Earth, we do what's called pronation. And every joint has a role to play, including the wrist and the little finger. Every joint in the body, all 360, should behave in three-dimensional space at just the right time, in just the right amount of movement, in, in everything it should do when it pronates. And then when it begins to supinate and propel offward, those joints have another role to play. And it's can you guide the body into proper pronation techniques and proper supination techniques? If you just even, just one of those, if you can get the body to properly pronate, you're running 
will be amazing. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. No, no question. And I've done so much speaking at so many marathons and other races around the country over the last 25 plus years since, since you and I were together. Um, and I always try, I, you know, I always try and stay in my lane. I don't have that scientific background that you do. My message is always one of imagery, bow and arrow and so on and so forth, um, to try and entertain the crowd and get in, in information across them that's easily assimilated. And I'll tell you two things for your viewers. Number one, next time, Next time you're, you're driving down the street or walking down the street with your family or whatever, and you see a young youngster on a skateboard, um, not doing tricks and stuff, that's a different situation, but just, just riding the skateboard down a, down a flat road, just notice how they strike the ground. Let's say their right foot is on the skateboard and they're propelling themselves with the left foot. Essentially, how they propel themselves is how you want to run. That young man is not, or young girl, is not going to put his or her foot down in front of the skateboard and pull themselves through you know, they're not, they're kids. They're not thinking about the mechanics of skateboarding. It's just instinctive, but it's the same way. Imagine that. And then the second thing is, is it really, you mentioned two things. And, and I would say, I agree with that hundred percent. I use four things. The wrist as number one. If you use the wrist properly, it activates the posterior delts and the lat muscle as number two. That's like the bow. That's where the lift comes from. That gives you the, the flight. Number three is where your ankle structure strikes the ground and if it strikes the ground properly like the kid on the skateboard that will automatically instantaneously activate number four properly which is the gluteus muscles and that will simply give you horizontal flight and that's essentially what you're looking for is horizontal flight i show my athletes i drive them crazy i send them videos of the animal the cheetah all the time as the perfect running machine land the slow motion, the slow motion cheetah video yes yes so so wrist number one Posterior delt, this area right here, where the drive comes from, number two, leads to number three, which is the, how the ankle structure slash foot lands under the center of gravity, like the kid in the skateboard, and number four, four takes care of itself. If number three is where it's supposed to be, number four will take care of itself, and you become a pusher, like the kid in the skateboard, as opposed to a puller. And that's really the, the short answer to, to, to the essence of run, tall, run easy. That's so awesome because now I'm thinking, and you brought in the fact that there's a quadruped animal in this conversation here. 100%. You go to YouTube and you look at that slow motion cheetah, you'll see the head stays still and locked on the target while the body's moving underneath it. And then if we think back to when humans were on all fours before we became bipedal on both feet, the wrist was an ankle. And you're telling me that the wrist and the ankle are intertwined. And if yes. we focus on those two ends of the spectrum, everything in between cleans up. Rocky, you are right on the money, man. It's, they are twins. I figured this out somewhere on the line. I certainly didn't invent it. I'm sure someone else did. But nobody ever taught it to me. It's just something I figured out, like you figure stuff out. The wrist and the ankle are like twins in how we work, how we work as runners. And once we figure that out, it goes back to what we said earlier on. It's, about, it's not just about the GPS, Garmin, watch. It's about figuring this stuff out and play and working on your game. And the wrist and the ankle are, if you figure those two things out, man, it can change your running a hundred percent. That's beautiful because usually at the end of these shows, I have a little segue into maybe one or two movements that people can do drills, if you will, that will pertain to the subject matter here. So at the end of the show, I'm going to do a couple of movements that help with wrist and ankle action. And the interesting thing that I've found is that neurologically they're partnered up opposing. So the right wrist and yes. the left ankle, left yes, yes, wrist, yes. right yes. ankle. Rock, the, uh, you took the words off my tongue, I swear to God. The, the, the opposing wrist and opposing ankle match up. They match up. If they're, too, if they're both too far out in front of the body, it's bad news because you get, it's gonna, it's gonna uh, create increased vertical oscillation and when it's like this, it's going to increase cross rotation. If, if they are close to the center of gravity, then you're going to stay tall and you're going to be more efficient. So 100%, couldn't agree, I couldn't agree more. The opposing wrist and ankle are sympathetic. That's it. And the actions that they take during running are also opposing. So when the wrist is extending, the ankle is plantar flexing. When the ankle is dorsiflexing, the wrist is flexing backwards so if you have trouble dorsiflexing your ankle you may want to work on flexing the wrist on the opposite arm and yeah. it's it's 
unbelievable what can happen when you start to work on that neurological chain reaction. It, it's, uh, it's, it's so true. It, it's so true. And, uh, you know, it's amazing how our, our careers, have, have, even though we don't, sadly, we don't see each other every day anymore, but, but it's amazing how there are so many crossovers, whether it be KSEO and then how our careers both similarly started at right, right around the same time, right? It's just amazing. And uh, it's been great to see. I watch closely. I follow you and how you've developed your career and you've become a master trainer now. And you're doing, it's fantastic. You've done amazing things. Yeah, very inspirational. Uh, it's, it's just, it's a joy. You know, we were talking about passion at the beginning when it comes to our kids and, and what they're pursuing. Well, I think that they're probably just seeing how we go from one day to the other following our passions. And hopefully that's yeah. a really shining example for them. So um, with your own running, as you're, are you, are you doing another marathon? Are you still doing marathons? No, I, I, no, I did the marathon last, the last marathon I did was, was a, in the fall of 18 in New York. Um, I've really just run, a, I, I haven't, I haven't run a watch. I, let me try that again. I haven't worn a running watch in probably two years. I run exclusively on feel. I know the routes that I run and, and uh, there's a, a town clock that I pass close to my house that I see as I leave, as I sort of head out on my run, I basically see at the time that I started and as I finished, it gives me a general idea of the overall time, but I just run on feel. I go back to the intrinsicness of my own running and at 50, closing in on 57 years old, these days I literally run how I feel. Um, I don't and try to- that, How does that correlate to your, to the state of your body and levels of injury? Do you notice that you are happier running and less symptomatic? because you're not so focused on your watch? Yeah, I think it's twofold. I think number one, I, I, for obvious reasons, I followed a schedule, an intense training schedule for many years with Greg Brock. And then obviously in the, in the latter years, my own coaching that I set for myself. And I followed that intense training because I needed to, because I was getting, I was training, uh, competing at a high level. And so it was essential. Um, but now I'm past that. And, um, and I just enjoy running for running sake. So that's, part of it and the second part is what you said and there's that that now i run exclusively on field and that has really allowed me to stay away from injury i just finished a, a 16 miles uh 16 miles a 16 week 40 mile a week uh a sort of street i'm not a street person but it just kept evolved and, and i just run on field i just run um some days that eight mile run will take me 60 60 minutes 61 minutes and some days it might take me 70 and i don't care I don't care. I just, it just, I, t I run as my body lets me run and that seems to keep me away from injury. So yes, there's no question. There's a relationship between the two, but between your time of day though, when you run is quite different than the average person, as I understand it, right? You run practically in the, in the middle of the night or early morning hours, right? I did for the longest time. Yeah. When I was in a different uh, area of UPS and I was working uh, essentially 4 a.m. to sort of 8, 30, 9 a.m. in the morning, um, you know, those brown trucks that come around to your home in your office, there's people, there's an army of people that load those trucks. And I was part of that army. So when I was competing, uh, it was essential for me if I wanted to get a certain amount of training or mileage in that I needed to do some runs um, in the middle of the night. And which was very interesting. Not that you wanted to do it every single day, but once I was out there and moving, it was uh, certainly tranquil and almost like you've got the world to yourself. And there's a sense of getting ahead, this crazy notion in my brain of getting ahead of the competition, you know, getting a jump on the day. So yeah, I would run at the strange hours. And that's why I don't tolerate very, very well when, when my athletes say they're too busy or they, you know, they want to blow off a run. It depends on, does your motivation to train uh, outweigh your your uh, your motivation to stay in bed or, or, or to find the distractions. You have to overcome those distractions if you want to achieve certain goals. Um, these days, I, I'm a different schedule, so but, so I don't do that. But um, but yeah, I did it for the longest time. But you just do what you just do, you do what you got to do. You absolutely do what you have to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. GP, this has been great. I really, yeah. uh, it's it for for the fact that we're just reuniting and having this lengthy conversation, it's just been a joy. Uh, our lives are so full these days that, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to throw a text or a message your way through Facebook or whatnot, but it's really just a pleasure to sit down I, and chat face to face. It really is. I love the word you, to, you use full and I use the word full and dense because I think people, they were, you know, people say, Oh, I'm busy. I'm busy. Busy is a, a, an overly used word uh, that people want to make themselves busy. I, I think, 
a full life is a, is much more depth to it. And yeah, life is your life is a very full, mine is very very full, and and that's a rich. There's a richness to that as opposed to just busy. You know, it's just yeah, it's full. So no question about it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, can I, do I have time for one last story? Yeah, please. So real quick. So you were talking about CF before. So last year I raised the uh, four CF. We raised a thousand dollars. Uh, just a, sort of almost a last spur of the moment thing. Um, Sam and I decided to race each other in the depth of winter, a hundred meters on the track, right? And I had it filmed on Facebook Live. And um, so people were asking me leading up to the race, you know, are you going to let him win or are you going to? I'm like, hell no, I'm going to let him win. Are you kidding me? Like, Absolutely not. I'm going to kick his ass. And then I'm thinking, well, I don't know if I actually can do that. So um, the night before the race, uh, I said to Sam, so what, what do you think? Yeah, you think you're going to, I forget exactly how I worded it. Basically, I was asking him how he was going to, thought he was going to do against me the next day. And his exact words, typical Sam, he says to me, dad, you're old, your running career is behind you, and I'm going to stuff you, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the day comes the next day comes it's a it's a gloomy january day uh, in the, at noon and uh we go out there he doesn't want to he wants to do his chocolate warm up he doesn't he has no interest in warming up with me at all he does his warm up he does his strides and then we come together for the race and i'm thinking he's i can't get out of the gate anymore as quickly as he can but i figured i would be able to run him down well the race started i mean he's as i expected he's out of the gate quicker than me that quick you know those quick synapses of, of a teenager and I'm about maybe 10 meters into it, 10, 12, 15 meters or so. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not catching him. I ran a pretty decent time, but he blew the doors off. Me. Oh, so, oh, that's so, like the greatest and worst day it, of any kid's life. Like day. I beat my dad. Yeah. Oh my God. I beat my dad. It was the greatest day and the worst day of my life too. It's hilarious. And um, so we finished. I said a few words to the camera, and I sort of Sam, you know, he's he sort of finished the hundred meters, and he took off into the distance as he decelerated. It didn't take me so long to decelerate. I wasn't running as fast. So now I'm talking to the camera, and I said, uh, Sam, hey, you're the champion. You want to say something to the Facebook, our Facebook, you know, uh, friends out there that, that that helped us raise some money? He goes, I got nothing, and he walked off. <laughs> <laughs> so, there you go. so that was funny. Oh, oh man! You know it's funny that you bring that up because I'm thinking to myself with with my with my young man here, Jack's 13, and and I was thinking I've got a few more years before he starts blowing me away, and and each passing day we go out and paddle or something, I'm thinking you don't have that long, you really don't. He's going to be blowing past you in no time. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Rock, Rock, I don't have time for this. Have you, have you, it's a question for you. Have you reached that point? You're 50 now, right? You're 50 now? Are you 50 now, Rock? I, I'll be 53 in September. Oh, you're 53. Have you reached that, you know, from the shoulders up, you still, like me, think you're, in some respect, on some esoteric level, think you're like, tw can do the things you're 25. Have you reached a point now where, like, oh man, even though I still run plenty of miles and you still strength train and do all the surf and everything, have you, has there been a moment when you're like, Oh my God, I don't, think I, can do, I don't think I can quite do what I used to do. I don't know if I can do that anymore. You know, my training has changed quite significantly from the time I was in my 20s, 30s, and, and entering 40 because I, I, I just I intrinsically feel like it needed to change, that the beating myself up with heavy lifting and conditioning numerous days a week was taking its toll. You don't realize it when you're in your 20s and 30s, but the wear patterns are already developing and you won't notice the, the aches and pains, the, the slings of outrageous fortune and so on until you get a little bit later. And I already, I started developing those things and realized right then and there that things have got to change. So I am, to answer your question, <laughs> I had a, I had a workout here yesterday morning with one of my other trainers. We keep ourselves apart, but we teach a live workout class. And he had developed his own kind of in-house Olympics that involved five events using body weight. And he wanted me to go against him. And of course, I'm basically the same age as his parents. And I smoked him. <laughs> good for you. <laughs> it, it felt so good. So to answer your question, I'm, I'm knocking on the door, but I'm not ready to open that door yet. No, I am actually focusing a lot more on 
not so much how big can I get and how lean can I be and because that's more of like a mating ritual for the 20 something year olds more like how long can I maintain how how can I improve my longevity those joints have been beat up so can I create better space and movement can I get a better relationship between those things like the wrist and the ankle that we were talking about can I improve upon that so that I can take what it is that I have and just keep on going right through uh, toward that sunset. But no, I, there's some moments, I will admit, there's some, some days where I'm going, ooh, that one, that one's going to leave a mark. But most of the time, so far, I'm not there. Rob, real quick, tell me about, you, so you got a new book. You have a new book coming out, right? And that you're working on the new book. You mentioned in the, in, in the message when you first reached out uh, to me. In the- look at you. I think you're the one that should be hosting this show there. Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah, actually, it, it goes along. Yeah, it's called Return to Center. And it's I like it. through, thank you, it's through Mascot Books, a company on the East Coast. It's going to be available the beginning of June uh, 2020, 2020 uh, on Amazon. But you can go to mascotbooks.com to get it. But Return to Center is really hand in hand with what you're doing in terms of running because we look at the gait mechanics as well as a person's posture and where is the, the weight of their body in regards to their feet? We can use any of those three kind of assessments to discern what kind of mobility drills, what foam rolling targets, and what strength components they may want to have as part of their overall training conditioning program. So it's not based on the fact that you're just hitting the big muscle groups and making them stronger or bigger or more beautiful. It's really all about the mechanics of the body. And can we create a conditioning program that brings us back to a more central balanced place so that like when you're running, you're not all over the place. You're not counter, you're not overly rotating. You're staying nice and balanced in tall, efficient manner. Rocky, two things. Um, first of all, I want to recommend the book to every one of my runners. And secondly, can, is this something you can assess, especially sort of now with the whole, what we're doing, Zoom, the world is changing. It's been forced to change, obviously. I don't think it'll ever quite be the same again in some, on some levels. I think this technology is going to sustain. So to that point, is it something, can you assess a runner from, through technology or do you have to be with them in person? No, by, by all means. Uh, the beautiful thing with video conferencing now it is that one it, we can record it so i can actually have somebody out there running and then i can freeze it frame by frame and notice every phase of the gait cycle and what their body is doing compared to what it should be doing that gives me a good idea of what areas are not opening up or closing down what muscles aren't lengthening or shortening the way they should and then you start to put together movements, programs, I don't like to use the word exercise, but you give them experiences within the body that light up the neuromuscular system and help to restore a more efficient movement. So I've got clients from uh, all over the country right now, Virginia, Montreal. There's a young woman in New Jersey I saw earlier this year, uh, down in Los Angeles, up in the Bay Area, uh, really Arizona, all over. But the nice thing is, is within the book, you can actually assess yourself pretty readily. And, and through dynamic movements, as well as just looking yourself in the mirror and just getting a sense of where you stand. And then based on that, there, you just go to the back of the book and there's eight different kind of, I won't say programs, but there's eight different outcomes that you can look through and pick and choose different movements based on that. And then use your central nervous system or your, your autonomic nervous system as a feedback system to go, okay, I just did that movement. Do I move better? Do I have more flexibility? Am I stronger based on that? And then you start to collect these ones that give you the best bang for the buck. And there's your conditioning program. Rock, for my runners and soccer players who want want to get them to reach out to you, what's the quickest and best way to reach out to you for them? Oh, uh, you can easily go to rockiesfitnesscenter.com. Okay. uh, Snyder.com. Just just do a search. Just put Rocky Snyder Santa Cruz and – that's the easiest way. They can email through the website. And yeah, definitely mention your name. That would be really helpful. And, and if I can help, I would definitely will. And if you've got, so yeah, we could definitely talk a little bit further about uh, the soccer players that you've been working yeah. with. And if there's something I, I can really help, I'm happy to. I don't want to prolong the conversation, but I am just amazed uh, with soccer players. I've always uh, thought of, and this has been reinforced several times over by the fact that track and field really is at the sort of the, the 
state of the art in terms of the physiology of warming up and the, pro the protocols. I'm very disappointed in even Liverpool and stuff. Like the soccer players, you know, they just, they just, the, the lack of, yeah, it's pathetic. It's really not good. And so well, I'm really level of that level of um, that high levelness. That's a terrible way of putting it uh, from, from track and, and road running, but track, you know, the, the running, the sport of running to the disciplines of the protocols of warming up and cooling down and range of motion, dynamic flexibility, very, very poor. So these soccer players, where I'm going with this, these soccer players need it. And that's why I'm thinking they'd be good. You'd be a great uh, resource for them. Yeah. I think most of the strength conditioning programs that are put out, even at that level are very antiquated. They're, they're yeah. not considering a whole bunch of other elements such as the way in which the body will compensate post injury. You know, the injured site is rehabbed, but that's it. They just go right back to sport after they have dealt with an Achilles or a meniscus or bursitis or whatever. But it's, the body is not integrated fully back into a rehabilitative way of, of moving. So then they take these compensatory patterns that they developed while injured and they bring them over onto the pitch. Yeah. And it just yeah. adds to more exhaustion yeah. further on down the road. I'm always amazed, I, you know, like you, I watch the Premier League, love the Premier League, watch Chelsea religiously. I'm always amazed, and just about, about Britain in January and February when it's cold. And I'm always amazed, you know, a star player, they've got millions and millions of dollars invested in. They'll substitute him out after 60, 70 minutes. And what does he do? He puts his sweats on, that's a good thing, and he sits on the bench. If I was the owner, I'd be like, Get him inside. Get him on the bike. Get him stretched. Whatever you're gonna do. Yeah. Why would you go sit him on the bench to, to, to for 20 minutes in the free? I don't get it. I yeah. don't get that. Achilles and hamstrings, the two biggest troublemakers. Yeah. And and, and if it was just a, a a little bit of an eruption on one season, you go, oh, okay, we got to deal with that. But because it's been a chronic thing over and over and over, no one's going, hey, why is this happening? Why are we getting? constantly pulled they're just saying oh it's part of the sport no it's it's actually part of their conditioning program i agree with you if your car kept having a starter program a starter problem you would do something about it you wouldn't just be like oh it's just the ford it's the way fords are made the starters crap right that's for sure absolutely i know i know my i know kathleen had a, i agree with you 100 kathleen you had a question for rock right Rocky, how do I get, if I wanted to do any of your workouts at home here? Put up, pay, pay the man. No, no, you can go to uh, my YouTube channel. YouTube is, okay. the channel is Rocky Snyder, CSCS. I've got a whole bunch of home base. There's a few home base videos, like one only using a backpack. That would be a really good one for you. And yeah. then you can also go on Facebook and be, and just like Rocky's Fitness Center. And we've got tons of videos on there you can oh, shoot right. from. Yeah. Rock, it's been so great. So great to catch up with you, man. I, I love to Dana and the kids, and it's great to hear you guys all doing great. You're doing awesome. It's, uh, it's been a bit amazing. It really hasn't. You know, I'm a little bit older than you, but our careers really sort of took off, so to speak, at the at a similar time, you know, in the, in the night. It's, just been, it's interesting. It's been fantastic. Great. It's yeah. honestly, it's, it's great to watch both paths, and they've stayed the same, like railroad tracks in many ways. Yeah, absolutely. It's I great. Great. the center. Rocky's Fitness Center? Yeah, I've already liked it. I don't oh. even know. Cool. Then go to that. And then on the left-hand side, you'll see a list, like uh, uh, one that says videos. Just click on that, and you'll see a whole bunch of videos pop up. Okay, cool. And if any of you, uh, shameless self-plug, which I'm not very great at, but if any of your uh, listeners, viewers, want to, you know, interested in a, a simplistic sort of book on mechanics, run to run easy, I would say the best way is uh, – is the ebook, which is at Amazon or uh, iTunes uh, or even on my website, runtoraneasy.com. So it's a, you know it's a simplistic guide. It, it seems to do a good job. So uh, that it's not expensive. It's like seven ninety nine. It's not expensive at all. So oh, that's beautiful. perfect. I yeah. love it. This is great, GP. I've I've really had a great time a great time getting chatting about running and and what's going on in the world of running and yourself yeah. and coaching. And good, good luck with Team Boomer again this year. And I and hope that marathons open up to some degree, where, or at least virtual marathons where you, you and your, yeah. your team can enjoy it. Definitely. And best of luck to you to return to center. I love the Elvis uh, connection there. It's great. It's absolutely awesome, man. It's awesome. <laughs> God bless.
keep up the great work, bud. So in this episode with Coach GP, what we were talking about is the relationship between the wrist and the ankle, those two very distal portions of the body that have a tremendous amount to do with your running. And what I told you would be we, we were going to focus on how to open up those areas, maybe re-educate them. Let's start with the ankle. Now, normally, I am one to not wear shoes very often, but in this particular case, I, I am going to put one shoe on because I want to show you a couple simple ways to open up the ankles. One is simply called an ankle tilt, where you're just going to roll the sole of your foot off the ground and bring the ankle down and out. And as you do that, you're going to put your body weight into that so that the tissue just below this ankle bone, right under here, is going to feel this openness, this length that we're trying to create. We can do the same thing just in the opposite direction by dragging the foot inward so that the roll goes outward like so, and then you're going to get a little bit more length and space through that tissue below the inside ankle bone. We call the medial malleoli. So those two are called ankle tilts. Another way you can try and open up the ankle is called toe drags. And what you'll be doing is having your foot back like so, so that the toe tip is on the ground. And you're going to be driving your knee forward and downward, kind of in a, a 45 degree angle. And by doing it this way, what we're hoping to feel is some nice opening right on the roof of your foot. You can turn the foot inward, or you can turn the foot outward, or straight on down and just find where it is that you have the most restriction and kind of work into that. So that's for the ankle. Now when it comes to the wrist, we'll have you do a couple different movements with the wrist. One is simply exploring your arm swing. So as the arm swings forward, the arm should externally rotate, the elbow begins to bend, and the wrist extends. As the wrist extends, the fingers curl in almost like Spider-Man shooting the web. So can you do that? Allowing for that elbow to flex, wrist to extend, fingers flexed. Now as the arm swings back, the elbow is going to extend, and the wrist will begin to flex, and the fingers will begin to extend. What is your movement like here? Are you able to achieve these two actions? Internally rotating at the shoulder as the arm comes back, wrist flexes, elbow extends, and then externally rotate the arm as it comes forward, elbow flexing, wrist extending, fingers flexing. Simple enough, just general arm swing mechanics. Then what I'm going to do is really work on my wrist mobility by simply holding on to a couple fingers here as if it were a handlebar on a bike and I'm going to try and drive my wrist upward as well as downward, inside and outside. What I'm going to try to do, however, is do all that motion while keeping my hand in one place. That's the reason for holding on to the fingers. Otherwise, you'll have somebody do wrist circles where their arm is still, but the hand is moving. It's not what we're trying to accomplish here. Can we keep the hand in one place and have the arm do the motion? Try it in both directions. Where is the sticky point? Where are those dark zones that you do not want to travel to? Try them out on both wrists. So now you've got a couple of wrist drills and a couple ankle drills. Do those prior to your run. Go out and see how your run is now. Before you go, our new book, Return to Center, breaks down everything we did today and a whole lot more. So check it out at rockysnyder.com. Our link is on our page too. If you still haven't subscribed to this channel, please do. Thanks for watching.